what Tim, I think I can sum up what Tim said in this morning's triage meeting was that it's a good line. It would be a shame to lose it. The contributions that I had to Psychonauts 2 are the ones that I do for every game, which is the kind of being the narrative keeper, if you will. Thanks, Morris. Hey, look out. Ingesting the script from whoever is writing it and making sure that it's properly organized and proofreading and checking for continuity errors. Tim, we were talking about a Ford clerk scene uh -huh. just now that you had written. Uh -huh. um, it's in the That's second... Great it was. Yeah, it was amazing. We were just, <laughs> we had a meeting just to talk about that. It helps to have people review his writing and ask questions and get clarification on something, whether that's, you know, you know, how the asking pointed questions of how do you envision this space, Tim? Whenever he makes comments separately yeah. outside of what he's written, I add it in. Damn it. Okay, I'm going to add that no, in. But you know, he'll sometimes deliver a line. I'm like, hmm. That's not Raz's voice, and I'll realize that he'll have, you know, Raz and Ford mixed up. <laughs> Sent a note to you, Melina, about at least one of the things. Looks like there needs to be a line switch because uh, Raz is talking to himself. I can't overstate this enough. The um, the importance of those stage directions that Tim writes, because it's more than the dialogue. It's that subtext beyond just what's happening for the characters it's a window into tim's world as well and into his mind sorry you had to see that raz that tells us something whether he wants to inject some levity into something or if he wants to you know make things more have a sense of gravity or Mr. Hey guys, let's get this good time over with our last session with richard let's just I rush know. through it listening to those voice files coming back what the <laughs> Rasputin? I was just thinking about how there's so many lines that have been in the script so many times, like uh, what the and uh, uh -huh. what the or uh oh, watch it, uh -oh. Watch it. hey, uh oh, hey, <laughs> and we'll just eventually like that's it, fine, there it is, there, that's the take. And those are really awesome, awesome little moments that I get to witness <laughs> and be a part of. I know that it's recording because the red recording light is on, and also. The numbers are moving. Trust me. That's a great sign. Not my first sign. day at Jablinski Studio. <laughs> I, uh, I thought it was. I'm an old seasoned vet at this point. You know, Jack recorded from home and he just delivered really great stuff. But it, at one point, I could hear a bird in the background and there was no way to edit it out. But in a lot of ways, that just was perfect. <laughs> you know, even though it like doesn't fit the game. It was indicative of, of Double Fine's can-do attitude. Oh, that looked painful. But take it from me. Feeling bad? Oh, shit balls. There are times when Chris has a specific designated take, and um, that would go on her editor decision list, or EDL. Oh, no. Tons of new things are at all pro VO now, which is awesome. So Sarah is going to be drowning in unblocked tasks. Well, I think I kept, you know, for me on the first one, there came a time when I started dreaming about Psychonauts and running around at the campground and it wasn't a nightmare. It was actually like I woke up like really excited that I had spent the night running around in the campground in this world that Tim had created and that the rest of us were building. And so I guess I, I held that as my guidepost of, I wanted to make sure that the worlds that we were building were going to be that place that I couldn't wait to go back to. And even if it was totally new locations, right? It's still, it, it's a, I want to go forward in this new space with these characters that mean a lot to me. So how do we make sure that, um, that that's happening? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what happened. So we can put she knew the project. She came from Raps. She's wearing a shirt. She's already on board. <laughs> and my name is Miyuki, and I'm an animator. And I animated um, Psychonauts 2. Yeah. yeah, so it was toward the end. Or well, I don't know if I should call it toward the end because it was two years. So <laughs> that's still a lot of, like, you know, a lot of time. But compared to everybody else's. It's, it's still like in blocking, I still need to do all the polishy stuff, but uh, yeah, just.
You didn't do the helmet thing, right? The the helmet song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was it. Yeah, I think it was Faith, Clam, Zach, and I all worked on that. That's awesome. Like you know, animators usually listen to that, even like you know how they are breathing. <laughs> all right, there was a breathe. Let's animate that thing. So. Uh, is this the thing we're looking at today? Yes, you uploaded. Yeah, yeah. So that's right. the the other scene. I, I did the part like you you know the the yellow submarine thing. Yellow submarine. Yeah. <laughs> Audie is trying to get the audience to clap. <laughs> Just like making eye contact. That's great. So good. So good. Not tired of this song yet. No, I, I think love it. <laughs> ever get tired of it? Are you getting but, tired? Yeah. No, I think I think so. I, I think that little cutscene, like being able to work on that little musical sequence, was my favorite thing. Me, you can do it. Nice to see. I'm have. singing. <laughs> I guess yeah, that's that's about it. I also did the 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 intro for the Ford male cutscene, like where the the giant robot Ford. Oh yeah, the thing I was animating a year ago. A year ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy going back to it a year later oh yeah december of 2019 wow you are really taking your time with this one. <laughs> can't even pronounce that word the fruit the variator what's that thing and like they're trying to like 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 slam their head on the patient and just that little animation that was really fun. <laughs> it was a, yeah a lot of like those small things i did a lot of like small characters in the the hollis casino all those like a uh, little spades and heart like waiting in the back of the uh... it's, it's a weird concept isn't it <laughs> basically it's, all right we have like four characters we know what the heart will be doing because like heart will be just sad and sitting but rest of the three i don't know just just put some animation <laughs> so i'm like i don't know <laughs> maybe we'll be doing the like, push-ups maybe using on one hand I think that, like, I mean, like, that's, that's sort of, like, what animators love doing. And, you know, like, when you go to those animation weeklies, people usually start, you know, making comments, oh, you know, I, like, it would be cooler if, you, if like, you know, camera angles are like that, and, like, maybe, like, more push, push, push it in on the face, and, like, gets all the nods and addressing those, and it just, like, becomes better and better slowly. Oh, I like that. That's really great, Yuki. Oh. I'm Julie. <laughs> I'm a senior gameplay programmer at Double Fine. Been here for three years now, and I came on the Psychonauts right about a year and a half left, uh, coming from the uh, studio's quality department of Microsoft, Xbox, where I worked on a bunch of games, doing tools and automation. Um, but I went to school to do gameplay programming, so that's why I wanted to make that switch as soon as possible. The role was listed as gameplay programmer, and I remember talking to Key originally and being like, oh, like, Chris must be, like, almost done with Psychonauts, like, because I didn't know what it was going to be. And he's like, I was like, ha, ah, you'd think that. <laughs> yeah, I touched a lot of different systems. Um, I kind of was, like, the catch-all person. Like, I was on level teams to do some custom level work. I did collectibles, inventory, pins, and upgrades. So, like, if a pin, like, doubled your attack power or something, that was our mod system. I did animals, petting animals, animals fleeing, figuring out why randos wouldn't fly around correctly because <laughs> one was too tall. <laughs> I did all the tiny objects. Like, when you run around in that one uh, Leptopus hotel, but it's the one that a gristle was staying in and all the objects in there they're all tiny objects they all have like this like faked physics thing where like when you overlap with them they go flying so i have like a level somewhere where i laid out every single object and then like would run through them and then tune it and then run through again <laughs> there was a time where tim started running through that level to play test it and was like "Ooh, these objects feel good <laughs> I feel like the one that's like most noticeable, at least, is probably the animals, like the petting and the animals and the fleeing. Like the animations and stuff like that, like somebody else did them and then I 
hook them up. <laughs> so like making it look pretty, that was more of the artist. Making it so that like bigger animals got the big hand, the little animals only got the finger. That's great. You guys are gonna be a crowd pleaser. <laughs> We've satisfied the Twitter account. When Tim decided that he no longer wanted you to be able to hurt the animals like you could in the first game, that was an interesting challenge because it was like, I have to make animals flee now. <laughs> and it, big animals, small animals are like, they all run away if you hit them. Yeah, we had like a milestone where it was like, okay, we need to figure out the pins because we had some ones that were like iffy, not sure if we were going to do yet. Uh, yeah, one of the pins we added is to uh, speed up instead of slow down. If you want to go and speed up enemies now, they they run towards you really fast. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't know if there's any like good place to use it. <laughs> Does it uh, turn on yakety sax when it's playing? <laughs> I think people were like, we want to be able to equip more pins. <laughs> I'm sorry, you can only equip three pins, and I'm sorry, all three of those pins are your ball colors. <laughs> I do remember I did make one suggestion once during a playthrough that actually caused more work for people and I feel really bad about it. Uh -huh. There's a point where uh, Rez has a line when you jump in the casino room, he's like, oh, he's in exile. And all I could think about was I wanted him to say exile because of the eggs. That's all I could think about Oh my God, that. I can't believe we didn't do it. <laughs> I'm gonna mark it for a re-record. <laughs> <laughs> okay, awesome. Thank you, Julie. But I was like, but it was so perfect. I'm so sorry. <laughs> He was living there! Yeah, in exile. Hi, my name is Zara, and I'm a character artist at Double Fine, and I do fun things which is sculpting characters in 3D softwares and the textures on them, make them pretty. <laughs> it was really fun when it was uh, mostly working with a Scott. I actually didn't know how famous he was early on. I didn't know. One of the first human character after the goat I started making was Gisu. I did some uh, filter research. I provide some pictures from my background and like, this is how you go outside in environment. You have to cover a show like this. But when you are not in your country, when you're somewhere else, you don't do that. Lizzie was one of the fun ones because she didn't have as much of like details in her skirt and stuff. So it was a lot of squiggly lines. So I had to sculpt and come up with ideas and what those materials could be. We didn't sacrifice the designs for technical purposes for example when you talk in a bigger studios even like disney or places like that when they like have characters they use a base model and then they use that as a base to create the characters but our designs were so unique and so different from each other so every single character was created from scratch we were doing as much as we could uh, like to make it unique looking or different. One enemy we had was one of the... May sound frustrating, but not as much for me because I actually was happy this happened. It was... Enabler. Enabler. Yes, I think we called it Enabler at the end. So early on when we had the design, I said, I think this is a little different from a Scott style. Maybe we can do something else. I built the whole character. We had the whole animation, everything was done. And then six months later, him come and says, I do not like this one. I want to do you. I was like the happiest figure I hear. I was like, yes. <laughs> now I can do like a redesign of this. Helmet was one of the first characters got designed, but one of the last one got made. And I actually made the version that never made it into the game, which was the one with the puffy, uh, uh, sorry, with the sweater. I made that one too, that I actually never made it to the game. And then I did the Emily version, which was like more colorful. But I love those characters, they were so fun. 
But uh, one fun thing I did, I was doing a sculpting workshop and I, I asked for permission, but I sculpted Gisu in real life. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. Character, character, character. Thank it. Get it ready. Get it in again. Another one. <laughs> Every oh. time there was like an animation coming in, I was like, oh my god, I got my baby. <laughs> it's alive. It's talking. It's moving. Uh, one of the favorite characters actually after animation and dialogue is Sam. Even though it was one of the simplest ones to create, but it looked super fun and apparently a lot of fans loved her too. Like uh, her sense of humor and the way she talked. There I was like, oh my god, this is so cool. I mean, uh, all the dialogue and the voice acting added to it, it was really good. Hmm. Your head looks remarkably unexploded. It must be the helmet. I'm Monica. I'm the senior archivist and culture manager at Double Fine. I'm Denise, and I'm the director of operations. But we wear a lot of hats. There's a lot that we are responsible for. That one hat for events is my favorite hat. It's the, it's the fun stuff. It's the things that we do for our employees. Oh, it is. They do really love it. And that's, I think, uh, one of the best parts of the job. Hey, hey guys. Yes. Yes. Moving yes. into the realm of Zoom, at first, I think I was really concerned that we were going to be able to, to um, people keep people engaged and interested and entertained. I think uh, a couple of events in particular, our first, uh, the, the Tommy's party, which is our, our anniversary, and it was supposed to be our 20, well, it was our 20 year, <laughs> and we had to be home. And then the Christmas party, the holiday party, that was, yeah. that was pretty amazing. And I think for me, the highlight of events we did during lockdown was the drive-in movie event in October of 2020, where we rented out a drive-in movie theater in San Jose. And we did a screening of, it was Adam's Family. But it was the first time a lot of us were seeing each other since March of that year, because we couldn't. It was huge, and but it really was mostly Monica. I didn't. She, she, oh, Monica. <laughs> <laughs> there's Denise. But there's also the behind the scenes stuff that you know. I was I was doing a refresh around the documentary, and you know when there's like, hey, a celebration, and then okay, we got champagne outside. <laughs> that's like us. Like that's yeah. <laughs> it doesn't just come with champagne fairies, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That can be the title of this uh, video. <laughs> if, we're, if we're doing our job well, you don't even notice. Yes. You're just having fun and you're not noticing. When you don't notice it, yeah, we've done our job. <laughs> Hi, my name is Maura Marr and I'm a senior environment artist here at Double Fine. I've been here five years. So everything, everything you see in the game that is something that the character interacts with that isn't an effect, uh, VFX, uh, is made by environment artists. So as an example, in Psychonauts, the questionable area has the family camp and our prop artist made all of the tents and other things that go in there. And then I did the set dressing, which was putting in like landscaping, sculpting the landscape, putting in all of the trees we had made, making the space itself. We model everything except the characters, but the set dressing is the most fun. When my kids work on dioramas at school, I get super excited because I tell them, this is what mommy does at work every day, only I just do it on the computer. So, and then I tell them my process and mostly they sort of eye roll, but I love that my job translates in that way. It's just, digital. Let's see, so I worked on the questionable area and the Ford levels, um, mostly on bowling and gravedigger. 
a little bit on hair, but just in a supportive kind of role. So a lot of the architectural rooftop detail in, in the bowling level was again, like an early attempt at a, a kit assembly for buildings in there that somehow made it through to the end of the game. <laughs> I really thought that those were going to get revamped at some point, but they ended up working, so that was great. I worked on Maligula near the end of the game, so that was a cool one because I was actually there with Jeremy French and with Levi, and we had Seth, uh, designer Seth, in there as well, and we would sit in a room and figure out what do we want this level to look like. You know, we would look at Peter's high-level art and then read what uh, Tim's description was, what he wanted for the space, and just brainstorm. What did we want this to look like? What do we want this to look like? So that went through iterations as well. So um, the trees were really hard. There was a, there were a bunch of us artists. I think Tristan made the final version of them. There's a fine balance between stylized and cartoony. It's hard to find. And then if you might find a balance, but it's the wrong balance for this game. So the things we look at for Psychonaut was what we called wonk where nothing is um, plumb and nothing is level. So everything not only skews this way, but then also skews that way. Kind of a, you know, a thing. You know, Jeff tried away, I tried away, and I think Tristan's way looks amazing. And we came up with a final good solution, but that is a good example of the iteration that things go through. So I may have worked on the questionable area, but the trees are not the trees that I worked on. You know, everybody touches them. We all help get them to the point where they're what we want. It's definitely a team effort. So one of the very first things I made for Psychonauts 2 was right when I was hired, um, I was asked to work on the questionable area, the redwood forest. I love redwoods, it's my favorite tree. So I did all kinds of research on fungus. We can use all of these lichens and everyone was like, this girl's a little strange, but you know, <laughs> creative, so we'll go with it. I ended up just making a bunch of funny little fungi or suggesting it for what we call the uh, foliage pass. And one of them ended up staying in the game, it didn't get cut. And those are the purple turkey tail mushrooms that stick out of the sides of the redwoods that you see once in a while in the questionable area. And I love that that little silly thing that I made right in the beginning just to get used to the style and stuff made it all the way through the end. Hi, my name is Becca Vessel. Um, I'm a gameplay programmer with an AI specialist. I have eight years of gameplay programming experience, and I've worked on NPC, animal AI, and boss systems in Psychonauts 2. They have different systems, but some of the core systems are the same, you know, like using nav mesh to kind of like path around, for example. Lucky, she's more doing kind of more of a sequence of attacks. That's just what Asif wanted. And it didn't need to be anything that's like really reactive to the player. She's the first boss that you face. So we didn't want it to be like super overwhelming, but the Cassie boss and the Maligula boss are though. It's extremely clear, especially in the Maligula boss, cause she doesn't even have like a cooldown between attacks. For example, if she's really far away from you, she'll either do the water snake projectile attack or she'll do a charge attack and then after the charge attack she'll do like a melee attack and similarly like the cassie boss even though she does have a global cooldown between her sequence of attacks she does have this way of evaluating conditions and being like oh yeah the player is far away from me i'm gonna do like maybe like the bee swarm attack or like maybe the player is like really close to me so like they'll do like the shush attack or like the swipe attack. Lucky's card pass attack um, is actually one of the more intricate attacks. Even for a while it didn't really feel like it was really that dangerous. Actually there's like a lot of different just intricate details involved with that particular attack. All the card decks themselves that she spawns as well it's the beginning point and end points of these splines that are dynamically being like moving with the animation. The card decks themselves, when the attack actually executes, there's like this multi-box like sweep that matches with the uh, card deck VFXs as it plays through that spline. It didn't really feel dangerous at first because I think Tim was really concerned that this wasn't feeling good. Whoa, look at 
look at those things coming through. It's like a subway in New York City. I love it. They're not that threatening, though. They're, I'm never going to be standing over there. They got to come after me. I feel like a part of Lucky's boss fight would be missing without that attack. And so I was like, maybe we could look at whatever the first set of card passes there is in like the first phase and see if one of those paths is close to wherever Raz is. If we do that, at least we know that this card pass attack will definitely hit Raz. And that actually saved the card pass attack from being axed. Looks like it's time for a fresh deck. Ooh. It definitely f even feels even more dangerous in the third phase of the attack because she plays like the table shock first and then the card pass happens after that. It's time to double down! What? <laughs> Foreshadowing. It's awesome. Because of that, you have to like jump on a chip stack not close to the card pass, which can be difficult. Or you use a love bowl, yeah. <laughs> For me, I really like working on the different variety of problems to solve. In all these boss fights, there was different variety of attacks that needed to be, you know, made. It was cool to be able to kind of solve all these different kinds of problems and like iterate on them and make them feel good and like either dangerous to the player and just like work with the whole team to kind of make this, this boss fight feel the, the best it could be. Awesome. Can't wait to play it again with all that new stuff. She looks beautiful. She does. A pretty lady. Okay, goodbye. <laughs> thank you. Bye, everybody. And I've never worked on boss fights before, so um, I felt like it was like a really big step up. I don't know. It's just like really cool to been given this opportunity to work on these epic boss fights. I'm Naoko, Naoko Takamoto and I'm a principal producer at Double Fine. Um, I was the lead producer at the end, <laughs> at the very end, like what, nine months of Psychonauts 2. I got the fun part. Video games are fucking cool. <laughs> like, they're cool, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm so happy that I got to work on Psychonauts 2. I'm real proud of that, you know? And I'm glad that I make things that like people they have fun with. I know a lot of people think that a producer's job is to like say no and make sure everybody's on track and all this stuff, but it's really, if I could, I would say yes to everything because people want to make a cool game. People want to make cool stuff, so why would I want to get in the way of that, really? But then there's like the other side where like I am looking at schedules, I am doing the math and seeing how much there is to make and how much time we have and I will make a schedule, but it's really just putting together, like, I'm usually given deadlines. Like, I'll, I'll be given the ultimate deadline, right? I'll try and, like, chop that up and make it more manageable so that, like, it doesn't mean anything to be like, well, the game has to be done in two years. That doesn't, that doesn't help anyone. Try and, you know, cut it up into manageable pieces so that people understand how everyone fits in with each other and why priorities are the way they are it is kind of figuring out what each team needs like as a discipline what's the work that they want to get accomplished and as people how can we help them work comfortably so you kind of want to get to know your team because one way of doing things isn't going to work for everybody and you know different things step on different people's toes there are different ways to communicate that to people like some people do really well by seeing it on paper some people just remember everything that's said to them or some people do well if they see graphs i kind of just want to figure it out and try and make like the information they need to understand um accessible the work that I do is a lot of it's just logical, right? So I just have to find information. Just the creative part is like, what do I do with this information to make it helpful to people? I don't know, like I, I come from customer service, which is why I think I do things the way that I do. Like I sold shoes, I sold clothes, I sold wigs, I washed hair, I bartended, you know, it's like a lot of these things. And I think that helped me be a producer, or at least influences how I am as a producer, because I, I am selling people something, you know, <laughs> I'm selling them like the next two weeks or the rest of the sprint. <laughs>
uh, somebody was unavailable to do the translation. So the really janky Latin, the Cassie books, that was for me. We just decided we wanted to do them in Latin. And I'm just like, sure, I remember something I learned 20 years ago and I haven't used since. Tim wrote a poem that I had to translate. So it was like six B's, but six in Latin is sex and B is is A-P-E-S. And I was just like, Tim, I don't think this is sex apes. I don't I don't think the book can be called sex apes. And then he just ignored me. And then they put it in that way. And I'm just like, you guys, you, you can't actually you you got it. I'm like Tim. You gotta give me a different title, man. <laughs> like, eat him, sex ape for it. What kind of perverse level is this? So he he rewrote it, but it was like a story of bees helping out. That is my one contribution <laughs> to the game. Oh my god, the credits. We had to credit um Naoko for the Latin translation. There will be no such thing. Just to make sure everyone knows whose fault it is when they send their complaint letters. Latin expert. Now, we're talking about up and her email address right there in the credits. Naoko at mybigboymail.com.